Hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on in our study of the prophet Amos. Actually, we're, our study is of God's word through the prophet Amos at the moment. That's right. Okay? And on behalf of Alice and Mark and myself, we want to greet you in the wonderful, the most precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The only name given by which men can be saved. Amen. Hallelujah. The only, the only name, the only way. So we're blessed that we can join again together in, in his word, that we might see the word more clearly, Jesus being the word. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter, the finisher of our faith as we do these studies. And we pray that there are blessings to you, that there are blessings to us. Yes. The word always is. Hallelujah. Um, we're going to continue on. We're in the fourth chapter of the book of Amos, so you might want to be turning to that. We're going to pick up where we left off. Right, we're, going to, we're going to be starting in the, the sixth, our study in the sixth verse of the fourth chapter after I do a little prelude. But before I do a little prelude, Brother Mark is going to ask God's blessing upon our time together. Amen. Oh, Lord, I just thank you for being with us throughout our lives and being here at the Bible study. No matter how our day goes, we can come here and study your word and relax because you are the Prince of Peace. And I just pray that you give us what we need to have more peace. Amen. Hallelujah. And I'll tell you what we need. Just a closer walk with him. Amen. Want to belt that chorus of that song out? Just a closer walk with thee. That was kind of a rhetorical question. <laughs> because if that, I'm glad you did that, not me. <laughs> because the fact is, you know, and, and by the way, on our Bible Talk website, www.bibletalk.com, on the front page on the left-hand corner, there is a sermon called Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Uh, it, was, it was something that I preached at a church here in the Orlando area in Winter Park a few years back. Because at the end of the day, that's what we really need. That's, all we that's, need. The, that's basically the only need that we actually have. Because God said that he, go read Philippians chapter 419, where Paul says, my God will supply all of your needs through his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So he will supply all of our needs. Because he already knows what our needs are. But we need to seek him mm -hmm. and his kingdom, and then all the rest will be added unto us. Right. And, and when we are... Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So I like that one verse in the Old Testament, what does the Lord require of thee? It ends with walking humbly with, with your God. God. Yes, Matt, he's talking about Micah chapter yes. 8. Love yeah. mercy, do justice, and walk humbly, humbly with, with your God. God. That sounds like a song or two. Yes, it is. <laughs> so in, in any event, as I say, we, last week we left off. We actually are, I'm, I think, I'm in a cheerful mood. I'm always in a cheerful mood. Hallelujah, because the joy that I have is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Right. Um, even though we have challenging days. <laughs> okay, <laughs> hallelujah. Um, but we're, we're dealing with a very, very difficult topic for most Christians. Mm -hmm. And that is the severity of God. Mm, yes. Who disciplines and corrects his people. Okay. And this is a topic... Uh, I, I, I pray that you don't dismiss this offhand, but that you seek God. And I always say, don't take my word for anything. Test what I say against the word of God, all right? Um, Alice and I were having a Bible study. We, we do a morning Bible study together. We call it our breakfast Bible club, she and I. Mm -hmm. And we're in a letter of James. And in the letter of James, it talks about if you receive his word in humility, mm -hmm. okay, well, if you, if you are not accepting God's word with humility, you're not going to be accepting God's word. That's a fact. Because the simple fact of the matter is you're, you're either walking in humility or you're walking in pride. That's right. And if you're walking in pride, you will always test the word of God against what you believe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you're walking in humility, you would test what you believe against the word of God. Did so you get that? What judges what? You have well, 
You have what you believe and the word. One judges the other. Well, well, no, no. The, the, the word is the only judge. judge. Right. What I'm saying is, if you're if you're if you're walking in pride, you will judge the word of God according right. to what you believe. There's one judges the other. One is the wrong direction, and the other one is that's the what right I, direction. That's what I'm saying. Yes. yes. All right. That's, so, but, but it's important to understand yeah. that. Okay. Because we have to come before the Lord with, with that humility. And understanding that his ways are not our ways, right? They're higher than our ways. So it is his word that we know to be holy and pure. So everything that we do here in the Bible study, its purpose is to, I don't want to say challenge what we believe, but probably to modify what we right. believe. Yeah. Because God's purpose in our lives is to change us. To modify our thinking. To modify our thinking. You know, we spend a lot of time in the UK, and they have over there a thing with the automobiles. Every year, you have to go through an MOT, which stands, I think, for Ministry of Transportation. It's like an inspection, a thorough, thorough inspection of your automobile. And uh, I was at a speaking one day at a conference in North Wales, and I said, that's what we're doing. We're here for our MOT. We're here for our annual MOT. God wants to modify our thinking. <laughs> well, it's true, because this is the glorious promise of God. That he is transforming us, bringing us from glory to glory. He's changing us and bringing us from glory to glory. All right. The greatest promise, I think, to the to us believers is found in Paul's letter. There's a lot of great promises. So. Mm-hmm. But it, where it says, that whom God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. So God is day by day, and at this very moment in our time in the word, he is changing the way we think. Mm-hmm. That's the purpose of the word. We're growing in the word. It's a living. The word is living and active. And we need to come away from this time in the word, knowing more about Jesus, seeing him more clearly than we did before the Bible study. All right. But you won't do that if you've come with pride and you already know all the answers. That's right. You'll be challenging the word instead of the word challenging you. And I promise you God's desire for you, for you, for me, and for you, God's desire is to challenge us with his word, that he might change us with his word, making us more like his son, Christ Jesus. So those who come before the Lord on judgment day and say, Lord, Lord, look what I've done for you. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. They didn't receive the word. They did not receive the word. Alice is talking about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. People coming to Jesus saying, Lord, look what I did in your name. I did this. I did. How can you come into the presence of the living God for the first time and face to face and say, look what I did? Right. Okay. So, right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I say that because what God is speaking to the prophet Amos in the fourth chapter of that letter, mm-hmm. that book, is challenging. Yes. And there is no doubt about that. And it's, it's a topic that is rarely, rarely taught, I find. In most churches, okay, we're going to talk about the discipline of God, the correction of God. And I said, okay, that you need to understand that we're going to look at a litany of disasters mm. that God has brought upon his people. Yes. But you have to understand this. Now, I shared this a little bit at the end of our study last week, but think about this God desires that none should perish. Mm-hmm but for all to come to repentance, to come to him, right? That's what it says in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord longs to be gracious to us and waits on high to have compassion on us. That's what it says in Isaiah 30, 18. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, rather that they should return and live, as it says in Ezekiel 18, 23. And it says that nothing he does in the life of a believer will have any result other than blessing us. For God causes all things to work together for good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, right? Romans 8, 28. So then we should be able to, like Job, accept good as well as accepting adversity from God. And that's the challenge, Job 2.10, all right? That's what the church has a problem with by and large. So that we can give thanks in the midst of the good, the bad, and the ugly. No matter what's going on in your life, that you'll be able to give thanks, knowing that it is God who is working his plan. 
That's, listen, give thanks in all things. That's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. So let me just start by saying, consider the words of Job. And it says, and I'm quoting, a man who is blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. That's what it says in the first, first verse of the first chapter of Job. And as the incredible tribulations began to fall upon Job, it says in Job 2, and I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish wisdom speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. You misspoke. You didn't say, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Speaks. You didn't say women were right. I thought you said wisdom. No. no I said okay. women. I'm sorry. Okay. Sorry. So the, the point is, Remember, it's talking about Job as a, 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 what did I just say? He was a... A righteous man. Yeah, blameless, upright, fearing guy. Mm -hmm. But he says to his wife, should I not accept adversity as well as I accept good from God? And it, this is God's testimony. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. What he said was accurate. God wants us to give him thanks, to accept whatever he has. The, the question is, okay, you think, you know, you're being, so many people are being taught that anything, anything that doesn't feel good comes from the devil. Not so. No, we're going to talk, that's what I want, we're going to talk about that. That's not so, right? But in all of this, God has made a way, right? Has he not made a way? Has not the Father? Absolutely. Yeah, Jesus said, I am the way. That's right. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He is the way. For us, God makes that a smooth road. But for the unrepentant and the disobedient, I promise you, it may be, may be a very, very bumpy, bumpy road. Okay? So the first thing in Amos 4, 6, the Lord says, but I gave you also. Now he's speaking to a people, his people, who have been disobedient. Now they're still being religious. We covered this really well in the last couple of weeks. They're still being religious, doing religious things, but they are being disobedient to the heart of God. So he said, because of that, I gave you also cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all of your places. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. What's he doing? His purpose is to get them to return, right? Now, what does it mean by cleanness of teeth? They got no food to eat. Okay. They, they, you know, you brush your teeth and you eat because you're getting food in them. What he's done is he's bringing famine upon his own people. But he made a way. You see? But he, Jesus, answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4. 4. And Jesus said to them, the Jews, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. John 6.35. So you're not, you're not going to go through that famine if you have a right relationship with, with the Lord God through Jesus Christ. He said it will not allow the righteous to hunger. Okay? That's his way. And then he goes on to talk about drought. Okay? Furthermore, this is verse 7 and 8. Furthermore, I withheld the rain from you while there were still three months until harvest. Then I would send rain on one city, and on another I would send not send rain. One part would be rained on, while the part not rained on would dry up. So two or three cities would stagger to another city to drink water, but would not be satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. But Jesus made a way. Jesus answered and said, now he's talking to the woman at the well, right? He said, everyone who drinks of this water at that well will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. John 4, 13 and 4. 
And Jesus said, and this is a prophecy through Isaiah 55, 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. In John chapter 7, Jesus said, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. God has made a way. Mm. You know, all of these things, you see them? He is doing them for a purpose. To get them to return Return to him. him. Return to him. We have an acquaintance in, in Jerusalem. Matter of fact, you, you may, if you watch our Bible Bites, you may have heard her sing a number of times, Ella Gorlick. And she wrote, I mean, she produced and sang, uh, I think she wrote all of the songs on it, a beautiful album called Return to Me. And it's all God's cry to come back. I mean, that's his desire, is that we have a right relationship with him. That's called righteousness. He's not looking for the religion, not looking for the sacrifices. He's not looking for the burnt offerings. A broken and contrite heart is what he's looking for, that we would return to him. And when we're not, what he's doing is trying to make a path to entice these people to come back to him. And this just goes on. It says, and then you know, the, the storms and pests to devour. That's in verse 9. Plagues, and he talks about plagues and warfare in verse 10. Destruction of entire cities in verse 11. All with one goal, to get the attention of the people and cause them to repent. And yet, over and over comes the same statement. Look at these things in in, in the the verses we just talked about. Yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. If you're not in a right relationship with God the Father, I promise you, he will do whatever it takes to try and get you back into a right relationship with him. Because he doesn't desire that you perish, but that you come to everlasting life. All right. The purpose of Amos is a prophet. He's a prophet who, who doesn't desire to be a prophet, but he is fulfilling the call of God. To expose you see? their iniquity. To expo- that's what, to expose the people's iniquity. That's what it says in Lamentations chapter 2, verse 14, that God sends the prophets to expose the iniquity of the people. So that they would repent. So that they would repent that's return and return to him. To him okay. Now, Listen to this and and prayerfully consider it. If you do not believe that the Lord directs the path of the lightning, as it says in Job 36, 32. If you do not believe that it is the Lord who raises up a stormy wind and that lifts up the waves of the sea. Check Psalm 107. If you do not believe that he can also calm the stormy sea as he did on the Sea of Galilee with his apostles, if you don't believe that he can choose to withhold the rain or send the floods, if you don't believe that he can harden the hearts of rulers to bring them down against his own people, or if you do not believe that he can humble or destroy the enemies of his people, if you do not believe that nothing is impossible with God and that regardless of what's going on in your life, he is at work in you both to will and to work his good pleasure, not necessarily yours. And if you don't believe that our God brings forth both good and at least seeming adversity into the life of a believer, you are not a Bible-believing Christian. You're not. And I, you know, I find that all too many Bible-believing Christians don't believe the Bible. Oh, they believe a verse here and a verse there that they like. But they don't believe that God will bring harm to you. Because it's not the purpose is not to bring harm, no, but he will bring harm. he will bring trials and tribulations on you. Well, it's not harm. Oh no, no <laughs> harm. I mean, you know, in, in Hebrews chapter twelve, he makes it perfectly clear. He disciplines those That's whom he loves. That's right. Yeah. Okay, he's trying to keep us on the straight and narrow. He'll but, bring harm to you for two purposes: one for you, one for the people that see you. No, well, it's not really harm. It's, it's not really it's hard. Adversity. It's yeah. adversity. Adversity, yes. Yeah. That's the point. It's yeah. adversity, it's right? Adversity. Yeah. But here's the problem, right? The natural man, Paul wrote this to the Corinthians, right? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, 15, and 16. He said, but a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. 
for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2, 14, 15, and 16. I'm going to tell you something. I, I don't know how old you have to be, but not very old at this point in time, to remember things like, remember Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans? Yes. That was in 2005. That's 12 years ago. Wow. Yeah. If you don't think that that was the handwork of the Lord, Absolutely. go ask him. But ask him sincerely. And how about yet better, or better, I, I, I speak judiciously here now, okay? How about Hurricane Sandy mm. that yes. did billions upon billions, also did billions and billions of dollars worth of destruction in New, New Jersey and New York. That was prophesied. In 2012. Well, you know, when that happened, yeah. as soon as it happened, I wrote something on our page mm -hmm. that I didn't see a lot of other people uh, I, I didn't. I, I didn't see any weathermen tell me this. No. I'll tell you what. I mean, did you get? You remember Hurricane Sandy? Mm -hmm. It was and did incredible damage. That still, New, New Jersey hasn't fully recovered. Okay, from 2012. That's five years ago. They still haven't recovered. So, did you get your knowledge or appraisal of Hurricane Sandy from the weather experts or the scientists? Or from the word. Or might you have gotten it from the Lord? There's a guy, I, you know, a guy whose name is Stephen, Stephen Picard. And he's a professor of earth and environmental sciences. And he said right after Hurricane Sandy, after it had devastated the coastal areas, uh, of, uh, these are communities, right, of New Jersey and New York. He said that it was considered, and this is a quote, an unusual event, what many consider a perfect storm. Yes. And he continued to say that the collision of three elements contributed to Sandy's severity. That's a quote. Okay. You know, you, if you've been with us any time, you probably know that I've said this. Alice has taught me a lesson. The answer is always three. So. Now, he, this, this guy did not quote this verse. I doubt that he very even knows this verse. But he said that three things were responsible. Okay? The Word of God says that indeed there were three things involved in that unique and powerful storm. And he says that he was responsible. I'm going to read from Job. Mm -hmm. verses, chapter 37, verses 9 through 13. Think about this. Out of the south comes the storm, and out of the north the cold. From the breath of God ice is made, and the expanse of the water is frozen. Also with moisture he loads the thick cloud. He disperses the clouds of his lightning. It changes direction, turning around by his guidance, that it may do whatever he commands it on the face of the inhabited earth. Whether for correction, for the world, for loving kindness, he causes it to happen. Three things. That hurricane was coming up from the south. There was a storm coming down from Canada in the north. And they met. This hurricane did something that hurricanes don't do. It got up by Jersey and it made a left-hand turn. If you know anything about hurricanes, they tend to curve. They recurve and they go out. Hurricanes coming up the Atlantic, they curve over to the northeast as they go north, right? This one, instead of east, it went west. It didn't just went. It made a left-hand turn. <laughs> it made a left-hand turn. Okay, think about that. It changes direction by his guidance. That was the hand of God. Absolutely it was. Now, oh no, you say that, the world is going to jump on you. Let the world jump. They don't, they can't assess this. They don't know because the natural man cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God. The question is, 
Do the Christians accept the things of the Spirit of God? Are you a Bible-believing correct uh, Christian? It says that, that God caused it to happen. Will God bring adversity? Yes. Absolutely he will. Because he is trying to get our attention to get us to repent. And I believe that that is ever so true in these times. Here in the United States of America, over in England and, and Great Britain, the United Kingdom, over in Europe, God is trying to get people's attention because we're running out of time. And people poop on that. No, 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 he doesn't do that. Yes, he does. And he does it out of love. You know, Alice and I, as a matter of fact, the three of us, uh, a number of years ago, we were in West Africa. And we spent a, a month or maybe a little more than a month in West Africa. And as I was traveling around and preaching, there was a fellow there, too, from Malta. Remember? Oh, yes. And he preached at one place we were at, and he was talking about how God would never do anything that would harm you. God would never cause you pain. God would never cause you. I said, what is he talking about? So the, the pastor who had brought us over there and was sponsoring all of this, I had a conversation with him. And I said, you know, you're responsible for him being here and you're saying that. Now, at the time, that pastor had just had a newborn baby. Right. Right? He and his wife. And I said to him, his name is Arnold. I said, Arnold, are you going to take that baby to a doctor and have get him what they call, get his jabs, you know, whatever. Vaccines. And he said, of course I am. Vaccination. And I said, do you mean to tell me that this baby, this newborn baby that you love so much, you're going to purposely take that baby to a place where you know he's going to be inflicted with pain? You know the baby's going to cry when he gets jabbed, don't oh, yeah. He said, well, of course. But you're willing for that baby to undergo that pain to protect him from a greater pain. Yes. What's the difference? What's the difference? You know, I'm going, to, I'm going to share something else with you right now. Oh, my goodness, look at the time. <laughs> I am taking my, my sweet patootie, my lovely bride, Alice. We've, we've been married almost 50 years, and I like her better today than I liked her 50 years ago. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've said... I've, been, I've had my life threatened for preaching the gospel. And I said, you know, I know if somebody threatens my life, I can deal with that. Mm -hmm. I, I know that for a fact because I have. And I've often said, well, if somebody threatens Alice's life, I wasn't quite sure how I would deal with that. Now I know. Mm -hmm. Because I have literally, in the past few weeks, I have taken Alice to a place. I have gotten, put her in, put, put in, put in. <laughs> I have put her in a car and driven her to a place for somebody to poison her. Yes. What? Well, my sweet patootie has cancer. She has stage three cancer. My flesh does. Your flesh does. Alice doesn't have cancer. Her flesh has cancer. <laughs> That's the truth. Because she ain't her flesh. No, I am spirit, as we all are. But the fact is, that's what chemotherapy is. It's poison. Now, we're trusting that no poison will harm her, because that's the word of God. But I would take her, and she's undergoing that for the better result. If God is doing something, if something's going on in your life right now, you need to examine it and see if it's the devil at work to get you or if it's God trying to get your attention because of his deep abiding love for you. He wants you to be in a right relationship with him, and he's willing to do an awful lot to get you there. So, Father, we just thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your love that you would go to such lengths, to such extremes, to get our attention and draw us back to you, that you do indeed discipline those whom you love. Well, till next time, God bless you and goodbye. So I cherish not all.